Today I'm going to talk a little bit about three theories of learning and theories in education um, that I think are really powerful to think about in tandem with open education resources and open education practices. Um, this is part of the Ready or Not course. The syllabus and the link to this um, presentation are in the description below. So go ahead and check those out. Um, as you can see, this is openly licensed. So if you need to use it for something, take it, enjoy it, um, do, do what you need to. So the three theories we're going to talk about are communities of practice, funds of knowledge, and third space. But before we get into them, I just want to sort of justify theory. So when I was in um, teacher school and was reading these different things about Piaget and Vygotsky, I was like, okay, great. I have to know this stuff for my test. Not going to use this in the classroom probably, but we got to get through this. Um, sounds great. I didn't have a great uh, experience with theory is what I'm saying in my teacher prep program. Um, now that I'm back in teacher school and having to um, engage with theory again, I'm realizing how valuable it is. Even those theories that I sort of had stuck in the back of my head and didn't really think I was using in the classroom um, from that first time through teacher school. So the important thing that I want you to get from this, the reason why theory is important is because theory is a lens that we use to view our environment. And whether or not we explicitly name and engage with a particular theory, we have these lenses that we are using to view our world. They are shaping our perceptions and how we interact and move in space. So I think it's important to take some time to think about theories to see what parts of them resonate for you, and then to have a more explicit understanding of the assumptions that you are already making about the world around you. Um, and then the second part is that theories, if they're good, are generative. That means that they can help us come up with new ideas, that they can help us understand things in a richer, better way. It isn't just about memorizing a theory to regurgitate it on a test. We're learning a theory so that when we go out into the world, we can, um, we can engage in a more robust, thoughtful way than we were before. Communities of Practice is a theory um, advanced by Jean Lave and Etienne Winger, who um, say that learning is more than just memorizing facts. It isn't about um, just you know, being able to say something for a test. It's done constantly all the time through lived experience and is really about taking on the identity as a member of a community through gradually more and more central participation in that community. Um, and so with this graphic, the idea is that you start out on the edge and as you spend more and more time engaged in the practices of a community, you become more of an expert, you become more central to the work of the community. And this is a process that happens gradually over time um, with, your, with your immersion in that community. So if you think about the last time that you picked up a new hobby, um, I'm sure that looks different for everyone. But for me, if I'm... Um, wanting to learn something new, I start by watching some YouTube videos. I maybe talk to friends who have similar hobbies. I might get on Twitter and start following people and engaging with them there. And so I'm gradually becoming part of a community of whatever that thing entails. Um, something that's worth stating is that this is kind of a critique of education, formal education and schooling. Um, the idea that we are uh, teaching students in a science class, not necessarily to be scientists, but to be science students, um, that it's a little bit less authentic than um, we would maybe like it to be, is, is worth noting. I think that there are some really good reasons for teaching students to be science students and engaging in that community instead of being scientists. Um, we want them to have a broad understanding and we want them to gain that quickly. Uh, whereas if we were having them engage in the practices of being a scientist, it would take much longer, would take more resources. 
Um, and they wouldn't necessarily have the broad background knowledge that we would want them to have going out into the world. So I'm not saying we need to throw it all out and just work in communities of practice, but I am saying that I know I've had students in my classes who weren't good science students and didn't enjoy being a science student, but they would make great scientists. And so we have to be careful about how we communicate with our students that what they're doing in science class isn't necessarily the same thing as being a scientist and give them some opportunities to at least start to join that community of, of being a scientist. Maybe not the whole year, but sometimes. Funds of Knowledge takes as a baseline that all students have rich life experiences just by virtue of being alive. And some of those experiences align well with school experiences and some of them don't. So Funds of Knowledge positions it as teachers' jobs to make sure that they are really using their students' lived experiences in the classroom to make sure all students have access to good instruction. Um, so for example, if you have a student whose parents played them baby Mozart when they were a kid and did sight word flashcards and always read to them a bedtime story, those are all experiences that transfer really well to school. Other kids have just as many lived experiences, they just don't fit well with school. Maybe some of your students are taking care of their younger siblings when they get home from school. Maybe some of your students are um, spending a lot of time outdoors and just free playing and having that time. All of our students come to us with rich background histories and Funds of Knowledge argues that um, those can all be brought into the classroom and should be in order to level the playing field. This came from a group of educators in uh, Tucson, New Mexico, whose students were often um, Mexican-American or recent immigrants who didn't always have a lot of English language skills, but who they knew could be really successful. And they basically got tired of hearing all of, these def all of this deficit thinking around their students and why they weren't going to be successful in school or why we shouldn't expect them to be successful in school and how they were, they were less well off than their peers. Um, so what these educators did was they went on home visits and they conducted lengthy interviews with their students and their students' families. And then they took that knowledge about their students' experiences and started working it into the school curriculum. So my favorite example from them is one of their students was a boy whose family would go back to Mexico every summer to visit relatives. And he would buy candy there and then bring it back with him and sell it to his friends and people in the neighborhood. So if you even just think about the math that's involved there, right? You've got exchange rates, you've got volume considerations, um, you've got rates, you've got all kinds of things with currency on top of the language negotiation that has to go on in there. That's a really rich experience. And so uh, the teacher, his teacher built a unit around just candy. Different students in the class shared their family's traditions around candies. Uh, they had different family members come in and make recipes for candy with the class. So you've got a cultural side of it, but then you also have that measuring um, and those sort of built-in math skills. You have experimentation as you slightly change um, what's going on there. You can do a lot of good descriptive writing activities about sensory things around candy. So there's a ton of stuff that you can do to leverage students' experiences, even if it doesn't, on the surface, seem like something that fits well in academics. Okay, I'm going to give a couple of examples here. If you're short on time, you can skip ahead to the next thing, or if you feel like you've got it, great. Um, but I've got, I've got two kind of robust examples to go through. So thinking about rurality and, and rural experiences, and I know a farm is like a bad stand-in for all of rural experiences because a lot of our rural kids don't live on farms, but bear with me, okay? Um, so just by virtue of being a half hour or more away from a grocery store, there's a lot of math that you have to do if you're living somewhere that's rural, right? How many kids do I have in the house? How fast are they gonna drink the milk? How long is it before I can get back to the grocery store? 
uh, how much milk do I need to buy, right? Even before we get into budgeting considerations, there's just some um, inherent math that goes into living in a rural experience. Energy sources. You think about equipment that runs on diesel. You've got your cars running on gas. Your plants are growing because of energy from the sun. Uh, you probably have a propane tank. And again, getting back to that math, you want to get filled in the summer so you're not paying those winter rates and you're wanting to estimate how long it's going to take you to go through your tank. Um, so there's a lot of understanding of different forms of energy that come from living in a rural environment. Uh, the gears there are standing in for all kinds of simple machines. Um, in general, when you're living farther out from uh, major cities, you're doing a lot of that work yourself, whether it's fixing, um, fixing up a car or a piece of equipment, tinkering uh, with some old junk that you have lying around, doing your own uh, plumbing or home repair kind of things. There is a lot of understanding of physics that goes into those that we don't automatically transfer into the classroom, but can absolutely be invited in. Thinking about life cycles, I would argue that most kids that grow up spending time outside have seen things being born or seen eggs. They've probably seen things that are dead and every stage in between. There's a lot of biology that goes into um, and can be leveraged in the classrooms. And then my next thing with the bees is just the idea of foraging and looking for your own um, food. Uh, that is often happens with kids who have access to um, more expansive environments that we consider uh, in cities or towns. The understanding of how organisms interact, how the seasons change what's available, um, what conditions you want to look for to find certain things is all really valuable knowledge that can be transferred into the classroom. And then I've got the papers and the writing there, just thinking about how many um, children's books are set on farms or in rural environments where students might be more easy, able to easily visualize what's going on in the story or be able to bring in their background knowledge and see, oh yeah, this fits with my experience or this is something new. So that's my, that's my rural example. My next example is about video games. Um, and I could talk for a while about gamification of school and how I'm a little bit um, ambivalent about that, but I'm not going to today. So video games though are learning environments. Um, video games teach you how to play them. And a lot of the same processes that are in video games, we replicate in schools or vice versa probably. So let's start with the scaffold guy over here. Um, most video games will take you through some kind of a tutorial, whether that's explicit or just kind of baked into the game. Um, most video games, when you're stuck, will give you some kind of a hint or have some kind of a mechanism where you're prompted to do something or you're reminded of some information or something in the game tells you, okay, try this if you haven't, if you haven't yet. Um, that kind of that kind of idea where we start on a simple version and then as you gain experience in the game, things get more and more complicated, you add more layers to it. That's in virtually all video games where you can start with something simple and then it uh, builds on itself as you get more comfortable and new things are added in to keep it novel, to keep it fresh, to keep you engaged. So thinking about how scaffolding works in video games versus in classrooms is just an interesting sidebar for me. Hopping over to the other side of the screen, which might be this direction, I'm realizing, um, we've got the little speech bubbles. Um, kids talk about the games that they like to play with their friends, whether they're in person or online. Uh, they read things about their games. They may be creating content around games that they enjoy. So there is a rich literacy that goes along with video games. Um, I do some outreach with the library system. Uh, where I'll teach kids uh, some, some coding in Scratch. And a lot of times when they share their screen because there's some kind of a problem with their code and they want me to look at it, uh, they'll have bookmark like, oh, okay, a Minecraft forum or the Stardew Valley wiki. They're reading about these video games because they have an authentic need to do so. Um, so continuing down, virtually any game that has levels in it, like where your character can gain experience, um, has models for exponential growth. 
it usually takes a lot less experience to get from level one to level two than it does to get from level 10 to 11. And so kids are natively having experiences with these that we just need to connect to school when we're talking about exponential growth. And then the last two little icons there kind of go together. There are usually multiple ways to solve things in games. There's usually a brute force option where you can just try to get through it or you can try to strategize excuse me, and find alternate ways through. That ties back to literacy. Sometimes kids are reading manuals and walkthroughs and guides to help them with that. But that kind of divergent thinking of, okay, there are multiple ways I can solve this problem. And I'm going to pick one that fits well with uh, my strengths and my interests as a gamer is a cool one. Um, and there's also creativity. A lot of the games that our kids are playing are sandbox games where they're just in there and they can make choices and do essentially whatever they want, right? If they want to go out and fight bad guys, they can. If they want to build a really cool looking house, they can. They can set their own goals within the game and then monitor their progress on those goals and share out um, what they're learning. Doesn't that sound like what we're wanting kids to do in a classroom, to have some creativity, to respond to things in a way that makes sense to them um, and to, to practice, to keep working at it as they, um, as they improve and get better to keep challenging themselves. Okay, one more thing before we get into third space. I think that this idea of funds of knowledge is gonna be really important in the coming year because I'm already hearing a lot of narratives around kids learning loss during COVID and I think it's important to push back on that. Just because their school experience wasn't as robust as we would have liked it to be doesn't mean that they weren't learning. Kids were still alive for that amount of time. They were still existing in the world. They learned things during the pandemic. A lot of them were following news when they didn't before more than they did before, right? They were getting their information from outside sources. Some of them had parents working inside the home. They had a window into what an adult job looks like and what the structure of their day is. It might not have been ideal, might not have been perfect, but it's giving them access to environment that they didn't have access to before. Okay, our kids learn things. There wasn't learning loss. It might not be exactly what we wanted, but we can take those experiences and build on them because that's what educators do. Third space and funds of knowledge are really friendly theories, like they go together really well. Um, they both look at the resources that students have already, um, the resource oriented approaches, and they look at how schools can be better made to um, utilize those resources. Um, this is a theory that sort of came about in geography and some of the other social sciences but has been applied to education. And um, it looks at when two different, different cultures interact. Um, it's not that one person is interacting in one only and the other person is interacting in the other only. It's that together they're creating this sort of hybrid third space. Um, in geography, it's the idea of, okay, this is um, what the space is like in the real world. This is like what it's like in the planned world of, of blueprints and policies and things like that. And this is how the space actually works together. That incorporates both these real and imagined components. Okay, so in education, what this has been used to talk about is saying, okay, first space is what the student does at home and those informal environments. And then second space is those formal environments of work and school, okay? So again, the idea that some kids have first space experiences that are really compatible with second space experiences and some don't. Um, and third space is saying that teachers need to more deliberately hybridize what kids are learning at home with what kids are learning at school. Every once in a while, there will be one of those studies floated that say, okay, adults can't do math, right? We gave them this math test and they, they couldn't do all these problems. But when you embed that math within daily experiences, like grocery shopping, like cooking, um, those kind of things, we can, we can do math pretty well. Um, the, the idea is that what you can do in first space doesn't always automatically transfer to second space. 
So third space is about saying, okay, we can't have this binary, what you do at home is home, what you do at school is school. We need to hybridize. We need to break apart this binary and say, no, really, there's, there's things that can be shared between these that just improve learning. We're building on background knowledge and we're allowing for better transfer from one environment to the other. Okay. And particularly in light of our COVID year where we were, you know, zooming into kids' homes and where kids were maybe sometimes seeing us in our homes, we certainly had a third space over the course of the last year. Um, and so this one, this one feels like a good theory to talk about. Um, again, there's this idea that some kids have more first space experiences that are easy to transfer to school and some don't. And that's why those educational inequalities happen. Um, in creating a third space environment that pulls in more of your kids' informal experiences and teaches them to recognize the strengths that they have and what the information and background knowledge they're bringing makes it a more equitable space. So three theories, what do they all have in common? Why am I talking about these? Okay, all three of these theories are social and cultural theories of learning. Okay, this isn't like the blank slate model where, okay, you want the teacher who is the expert giving the kids the information as directly as possible by lecture. They write it down, they memorize it, they tell it back to you on a test. These theories of learning all state that Learning happens in community. Learning happens when we are engaging with others and we can do more together than we could ever do on our own. Um, they are all kind of saying that we learn through experiences by doing things and by doing things with others, by doing things in community. And that this has to do with our identities. Who we are as people interacting with each other is a crucial part of the learning experience. So um, with what I was talking about with the blank slate model, um, in that case, you wouldn't want your students talking to each other, right? Because they aren't experts, their ideas are not fully formed, and so you would want to keep that away because it could possibly give kids the wrong idea or they might practice the wrong information. These theories are really saying that when kids are talking to each other and engaging with each other around disciplinary ideas, they are practicing them. They are taking on those identities. They are trying things out. And that is where learning happens. It's not something that's just a one-to-one, -one, I have a piece of information, I give it to you. It is a conversation where we are both sharing and negotiating and what we are coming up with is more than the, the sum of its parts. So what does this have to do with OER? <laughs> coming back around. Take the non-disposable assignments idea, which is part of open education practices. These are assignments that don't just get given to the teacher, they become a part of the classroom resource library, right? So you have a bigger audience, you're creating something that is valuable in your community, and authorship is extended to everyone. If you're remaking a textbook, um, you are taking those, those sort of basic um, sort of boilerplate textbook type thing to start with, and then you're making it personal, whether that's kids adding in pictures, writing stories, that's those little sidebars we always have in textbook that try to make it more practical, coming up with their own analogies. These are all ways that you are opening up those spaces for kids to bring what they've learned at home and apply it in school and see how it relates to the content that we want them to learn. And whether or not you're doing this with OER, this is just good pedagogy. It's just good teaching. You're building on kids' background knowledge. You're allowing them some choice and flexibility in what, they are, what they're showing you, which goes back to universal design for learning. And this has to do with equity, too. Some of our kids are more prepared for school than others because of their experiences, but it's our job as educators to make sure our learning experiences take into account all of those rich ideas that kids have and, and can allow everyone to bring something of their self into the classroom. So I'll end with this question, what does this look like in your classroom? Okay, 
how does sharing the stage work in your classroom so that you're not the only one giving information? What does it look like? Um, who, who are you inviting in? Because if we're not, if we're not explicitly inviting all students to participate in the environment of the classroom, we're making it really clear that some experiences are more valuable than others um, and that some people are good fits for school and some people aren't. So think about how these ideas could change how you interact with your students or how they maybe put a label or a name on something you're already doing or something that you already felt in your gut. What do these look like in your classroom? And I would love to hear about it.